love you. Come on, every hand up in this place, side to side, front to back. Jesus, speak to us today. Lord, do what only you can do in these moments. Lord, we feel your presence in this place already. God, I pray that you would take these moments together. You would take them and you would tailor make them for somebody's life, for somebody's moments right now, God. Lord, I pray that you would give somebody their next step in this place today, Lord. I pray somebody would get peace today, Lord. Lord, we give you all the praise and all the honor. Before we go any further, we stop and in faith, we're gonna go ahead and thank you in advance. Come on, local church. Can we put our hands together this morning? Amen. Amen, amen. Hey, find a seat, find a seat on the way down. Give three people a high five. Tell them, say, that worship, I don't know if it was for you, but it was for me. I needed that. My goodness, I needed that. Man, exciting times in local church, man. I don't want to waste a whole lot of time. We are in week four of a series called Asking for a Friend. And let me give you some context. The purpose of this series is to kind of step into maybe some uncharted territory and answer some really tough questions. I think some questions that all of us have that maybe no, none of us want to like put our name on, so we're going to ask them and then we're going to follow it up with, by the way, asking for a friend. Okay, so in this series, week one was a tough one. We went for it on week one, we preached a little message called, Why Did This Happen? Make it make sense. You can go on YouTube, answer the questions. Why do bad things happen to good people? Week two, preached a little sermon called, How Did I Get Here? And we talked about Samson, just one step, one day. And then come on last week, back to school Sunday, we gathered around the thought of family, how do I do this? That was, that was, that was a challenge, right? Family, how do I do this? But I'm excited for week four. Anybody got a Bible? Wave at me if you got a Bible, wave at me. Come on, anybody got a leather Bible? All the Christians in the house, praise God. Praise God. Here we go. Matthew 18 is where we're going to be hanging out. Matthew 18. Going to read some scripture. Going to title our sermon this morning. And we're going to go for it. Here we go. Matthew 18. If you're there, say I'm there. If you're not, look at the TV. Okay, here we go. Matthew 18, verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. So he began the settlement. A man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Verse 25, since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children all be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell to his knees. He was like, hey, be patient. I promise I'm gonna pay everything back. Verse 27, the servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt and let him go. Verse 28, but when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants, found one of his buddies who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell on his knees, begged him, man, be patient with me, just like the king was patient with you, and I will pay it back. Watch this. But he refused. Instead, he went off. Everybody say, he went off. He went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. Verse 31, when the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged, went out and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant, you wicked servant. I canceled everything you owed because you begged me to. Shouldn't have you had done the same thing for your buddy? Verse 34, in anger, the master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all the debt he owed. This is how our heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from the heart. I wanna to talk to you today around this thought. You can write this down. How do I heal? How do I heal? Let's pray one more time. Lord, we love you. Thank you for meeting us here. God, I pray that you would take this word, tailor make it, Lord. We wanna see you in a real powerful way, Lord. I pray that your voice would be louder than mine. Hide me behind your cross. We love you. We ask in your precious and holy name. Come on, everybody said. Come on, everybody said. Come on, one more time. Put your hands together this morning. It is good to be in church. Good to be in church. Other day I was on the road and we were driving and I saw a truck. Reminded me so much of my truck when I turned 16 years old. Come on, I got a year 2000 Chevy Silverado, okay? I know everybody gets like new cars today when they turn 16, not your boy, okay? This thing, it was sweet though. It was my pride and joy. It was amazing. It had, uh, man, I had some Nitto trail grapplers on there. I had dual exhaust. Every time I got gas, I also had to refill the coolant reservoir, but nonetheless, okay? It was an awesome truck, 275,000 miles. 
Uh, I think this thing was amazing. And how do you know? It was just a two-door, so it was just like a couch inside, but I had a 12 behind the passenger seat, which is when you're 16, that's all you need. You couldn't like lean the seat back, but that truck could beat, okay? This truck was awesome. I love this truck so, so much, but this truck had an issue. Every summer, for some reason, this truck, the AC would always go out. And I don't know if you're from Savannah, maybe you're here visiting, but you notice walking in, driving a car in Savannah, Georgia, in the summer without AC, like, like people get saved from that. That's like a picture of hell, okay? Like this is a big deal. But, but I got a solution. I never got the AC fixed, not because I was cheap, because I was broke. I never got the AC fixed, 16 years old, but I got a solution. Anytime I would get in the car and I was hot, I would just roll the window down. And people would get in my car and they'd be like, Andrew, it is so hot in this car. It's July and you don't have AC, I'm burning up. I'd say, I got it, bro, relax, roll the window down. And I spent years just rolling the window down, just dealing with it. How many of you know my truck was functioning, but my truck was dysfunctional? Like it worked, it got by, but it was not operating at its full capacity. I wanna be as honest as I know how to be today. Some of you, you're getting by, but you're not operating at full capacity. I rolled the window down, I got used to the dysfunction. Some of us in this room, you have acclimated to the dysfunction in your life. Like you know they shouldn't treat you like that. You know it's not okay, but you just roll the window down. Like I know that you should bring it up and have those conversations, but you don't, you just roll the window down. I'm gonna conceal it, and I'm gonna conceal it till one day I just absolutely lose it. But until then, I'm gonna roll the window down. I know I need closure. I never got closure from that incident. Instead, I just rolled the window down. Here's my prayer on week four of asking for a friend. I pray some people in this place, you would stop rolling the window down. You would actually approach the problem. You would actually start to begin to heal. How many of you know, you can write this down. Um, you can't put a Band-Aid on a bullet hole. Sounds like a country song, I think it is. <laughs> you can't put a Band-Aid on a bullet hole. The family pain, just put a Band-Aid on it. Just put a Band-Aid on it. It's the elephant in the room, just put a Band-Aid on it. Don't bring it up. The relational pain, I don't wanna run into them because if I run into them, I never fixed it. I just put a Band-Aid on it. Just put a Band-Aid on it. Here's my thesis for where we're going. I want you to write this down. My goal is that people would find healing and understand this. Forgiveness, yes, is a release, but healing is a process. Well, like forgiveness, it's a moment, it's a release. But after that, how many of you know forgive, like healing, that's a process, that is real. And my goal today is some people would step into that process of healing. I think sometimes in church we gather like this and we talk so much, preachers, myself included, I'll make fun of us, we preach so much to your eternity that we never stop and preach to your reality. Like honestly, like what a shame it would be. Local church is growing at an unbelievable rate. We are planning, we are scheming, we are believing, but how terrible would it be to have a growing church but not have growing people? Like I wanna grow in church but I want growing people more. There are people in this room, listen to me, you can write this down. You have punched your ticket to heaven. You're going to heaven, but you are living bound on earth. You're not free on earth. You're just waiting for one day when I'll fly away. God wants you to have freedom today. Like local church, we, we preach, I want you to go to heaven. A lot of our sermons have to do with that. We end sermons like that, right? But part of me, like I also want you to thrive here on Earth, it's this journey of forgiveness. Just because you come to local church does not mean that you have a functional life. Just because you responded to an altar call does not mean you have a great family. Just because you came to local YA night does not mean you know how to balance your checkbook. Come on, anybody thankful for a God? Come on, that in the Bible, it talks about these principles. Like, that's one of our passions at local church is when we take stage, we actually wanna get up here and preach practical sermons that don't just preach good on Sunday, but live even better on Monday. So on behalf of all preachers, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that we have stood up here and preached answers to questions nobody's asking. 
But at local church, we're going to get to the nitty gritty. My goal today is some people in this place, you would begin to heal from the hurt that others have caused. I want to give you some tools today. I want you to write these down. I've learned the older I've gotten that the faintest ink from a pen is stronger and better than the best memory. I want you to write these down because I think in churches like ours, we can come in and we can experience great and we're like, that was so good, praise God, the worship, the sermon. And then we're like, we feel good for the rest of the day on Sunday. And then we get to work on Monday and we open the door and we're like, what are you preaching on again? So we leave church with an experience, but we didn't actually leave church with any tools. So I want to give you some tools, some handles today, some really practical stuff. Write this down. Unaddressed hurt turns into hate. Unaddressed hurt turns into hate. Simple definition for hate. Write this down. A intense dislike or disdain for something or someone. You really just don't like something or someone. I know we're in church. We're all acting like Christians with our iced coffees. And we would never, ever admit that we don't like a lot of Christianese, a lot of fake church laughs. You know what a fake church laugh is? <laughs> God bless, guys. Good to see you, Pastor. God is good. And all the time, God is good, right? Like, we just come in here and we do this, and it's like, I actually would prefer you act like that on Monday, not on Sundays. Like, Sunday's actually the day you can show up to church and take the mask off and be real, raw, and vulnerable. Monday's when you actually need to show up and act like the church and be the hands and feet of Jesus. So I got a question, and I might get in some hot water here. Might get in trouble a little bit. Um, who do you hate? Pastor, I just, I, I just, I don't hate anyone. I would never say that. I know, I know you're not supposed to, but who do you hate? I'm not preaching to the projected you this morning. Let's go ahead and get that out of the way. I want to preach to the real you. Who do you hate? And I know you're a mature Christian. You would never say you hate something. But did you know hate has a sound? Hate has a tone. Hate has a body language. Hate has a thought pattern. Like some of you today, you hate your mom. Why do you hate your mom? Because she was always on your case. And now that you're older, you've distanced yourself because you don't want to go there. Some of you, you hate your dad. Why do you hate your dad? Because you, he abandoned you when you were younger. Others of you, you hate your husband. Why do you hate your husband? Because your husband cheated on you. Others of you, you hate those old friends. And the reason you hate those old friends is because they lied about you. I meet you people all the time. You'll show up to local church, and I know you mean well, but you'll say things like, oh, just a breath of fresh air when I walk in here. I love it. I love this church because, Andrew, did you know prior to local church, I hated church? And you hated church because typically a church person hurt you. Unaddressed hurt always turns to hate. My goal today is that you would address it. Don't miss this. Hate today, sorry, hurt today turns to hate tomorrow, which eventually goes back to hurting people. I was thinking this week, what is the first thing that I can remember hating? I went all the way back to my childhood. Like, what was the first person, place, or thing that I hated? And I went back to five-year-old Andrew Moore. And the person that I hated was the bully in my neighborhood. Come on, anybody have a bully in your neighborhood? And this bully was bad. This bully was mean. This bully had a cussing problem. This bully was a foot taller than everybody. This bully, oh man, this bully would make fun of you. This bully, um, her name was Christina. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. His name was Chase. His name was Chase. And Chase was, was maybe, I don't know, Chase maybe in sixth grade. Stole my bicycle one time in my front yard. Stole my, stole my basketball out of my front yard. I mean, this guy was unbelievable. And Chase cussed. And I don't know about you, but I grew up in like a strong Pentecostal household. We weren't allowed to cuss. Okay, I often joke sometimes like, like my first slow dance was to our God is an awesome God. Okay, like, like this is my life, okay? Um, not only could we not cuss, there were other words in our home that weren't real cuss words, but they were cuss words in the Moore home. Like we couldn't say shut up. I, I feel, I'm sorry, I feel bad saying it. My parents down here. Uh, sorry. I just, it's just, but, but, but I would come home, and when I was a kid, I couldn't talk very well. I still don't talk super well. It's ironic. But, but I couldn't say my S's. 
all of my S's sounded like F's. So his name was Chase. And I'd show up, and I'd show up, Dad, Dad, I'm five years old, Dad, Dad, Chase fed fud up. He fed fud up. Chafe isn't a Christian, Dad. He's not a Christian, right? But I'm like, he's not a Christian, Dad. What are we going to do? And my dad had this thing, and it's something that stuck with us all the way through. Even me and my friends do this today. My dad would say, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray for Chase. We're going to pray for him. Write this down if you're taking notes. It's going to pop up right here. Taking pain caused by people to God in prayer will always change your perspective. Taking pain caused by people, taking it to God in prayer always changes your perspective. There's people in this place, the pain, the trauma of years past is so real and you're so hurt. And I would encourage you, take it to God in prayer. Like, like we're here, it's August. Don't just take it to God in prayer. Why don't you commit to being in the house of God through the remainder of 2024? Like just get in the house of God. Get around the people of God. Get around the things of God. Get in the house of God. I'm just old school enough to believe that, come on, when the worship goes up, chains come down. I'm old school enough to believe that when the preaching of God's worth goes forth, come on, perspective shifts. Get in the house of God for the remainder of the year. Not only do you need to be in the house of God, you need to be in the presence of God. Well, Andrew, how do I get in the presence of God? Write this down. Prayer takes you in the presence of God. Take the pain to God and pray. Take it to God. Pray. And so many times when I began to pray, we would, we would pray for Chase <laughs> there in the neighborhood. And as, as we would begin to pray, all of a sudden, this is true into adulthood, all of a sudden your heart becomes softer for the people who have hurt you. All of a sudden you begin to see things from a different angle. All of a sudden you begin to see like the people are hurting me. They actually have their own demons that they're dealing with. Why? Because hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. And the cycle's crazy. Because if you don't deal with your hurt, your hurt turns to hate. And therefore, unintentionally, you begin to hurt others. The people you reject your whole life, if you aren't careful, you will begin coming, becoming the same thing that you hate. Got another tool right here. Write this down. How you respond to hurt will determine your future. How you respond, oh, it's a determining factor. Like this word we're going to talk about today, um, the older I've gotten, the more I've learned. It's a loaded word. It's an intense word. Uh, it's a layered word. Uh, the word, it, it's, it's the F word. Forgiveness. Whoa, relax. All of you were like, oh, it's getting provocative. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is a tough word. There's many Christians that don't like sermons on forgiveness because they think sermons on forgiveness is actually a form of victim blaming. Andrew, you're going to take a whole Sunday and talk about forgiveness and you're going to put that back onto the victim who's already gone through so much and they're going to have to look at the person who hurt them and are you putting it on them to say, I forgive you. Well, I would just say to that person, I strongly disagree with you. But, but let me break down as to why I disagree with you. I understood how you got there. I understand your thought pattern as to why you think it's victim blaming. Because here's the truth, write this down. Healing hurts. Oh man, it hurts. Healing is painful. Healing is hard work. Forgiveness, come on, that is tough. And anybody who says otherwise has never been hurt by other people because it is painful. I heard someone say one time, they were like, the way I forgive is the first thing I do when I forgive is I have to come to terms with the fact that the person who hurt me is an idiot. <laughs> That's not true this morning, okay? But how do I forgive? How do I move on? How do I heal? E even as I say that, I can feel the tenseness in the room. The, the room just gets tight because unforgiveness is holding on. Forgiveness is releasing so you can accept the healing power of Jesus. Don't miss this. So many of us, we live with close, I'm holding on. I can't let go of this. I must hold on. I told you at the very beginning, forgiveness is a release. And it's not till you release that you can actually receive the healing power of Jesus. I talk about my girls all the time when I preach. I have a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. 
And just to kind of give you, their personalities are totally different. Like I'm, I'm talking, they're totally different. I'll give you an example. Um, well, well, first of all, Paisley's seven, so she's a little taller. Evie, come on, she's five, so she's shorter. So Paisley's just much bigger, much taller than Evie, but Evie has never backed down from a fight. She's down to rumble. Uh, their personalities came out. We were at uh, Universal Studios this summer. We took the girls to Universal Studios, the second happiest place on earth after local church. We took them to Universal Studios and um, we're there. And when they wanted to go to, I believe it's called uh, Marvel Island, familiar? Superhero Island. And we're walking around and can we just all agree, like the actors inside of Marvel Island at Universal, I'll even throw Disney in there, um, they need to chill out. They need to relax. Like they're walking around talking trash to my five-year-old, my seven-year-old. I'm like, how much does Universal pay you for you to behave like this? This is crazy. And we're sitting there and we're over there by Spider-Man. And y'all know who the Green Goblin is? I think I'm saying that right. The Green Goblin came out. And the Green Goblin came out and he began to talk trash to my family. I mean, he's in my five-year-old's face. He's in my seven-year-old's face. He gets in my face. I'm like, okay, this is a lot. Um, and, and we're standing there as a family of four, and he looks at me, and he looks at Naomi, and he goes, hey, man, um, he's in character. Is she with you? He's just talking trash, right? And I look at Naomi, and I'm like, I've never seen her in my life. <laughs> and then he looks at Paisley. Paisley's my seven-year-old. She's, she's relatively sensitive. She's, you ever cried so hard you convince yourself you have asthma? <laughs> she is just crying and he gets in her face and she's like hey is that woman with you and Paisley's crying she's like no <laughs> I've never seen her in my life <laughs> but then the green goblin gets in my five year old's face <laughs> and he says hey is that woman with you and Evie stands up and goes yeah <laughs> I said that's a real superhero right there that's Wonder Woman Anyways, we took them to the pool a lot this summer. And we took them to the pool so much. And, and they usually play really great together. But the other day, I was looking over there. And um, I don't know what Evie said to upset Paisley. But Paisley has her by the shoulders, by the arms. And Paisley is proceeding to just dunk her in the water. <laughs> not like baptism, okay? Um, they pretend that too. I was like, y'all are not ready to get baptized. They're over there in the name of the Father, the Son. I'm, I can't make this up. I'm like, we're going to wait till middle school. Um, but, but, but Paisley's over there dunking Evie in the water. So I run over, I'm like, whoa, stop. Paisley, what are you doing? You're bigger than her, not so you can do that. You're bigger than her so you can protect her. And Evie's like in the water. Paisley's still going. And I said, Paisley, stop. Tell your sister I'm sorry. Paisley's crying. She's like, Evie, I'm sorry. Say it again. I'm sorry. And I'm like, Evie. You tell her, I forgive you. And Evie comes up out of the water. <gasps> trying to make her way to the edge of the pool, right? I'm like, say it, Evie. Say you forgive her. <gasps> She's just trying to get some air. And I caught myself. The church does this. The church does this. As a leader, I do this. There are some people in this room you wandered in here, and if you're honest with yourself, you are here just trying to catch your breath. <gasps> I'm just trying to find, a, I'm just coughing, trying to get to the edge of the pool. And, and it's tempted when you hear sermons like this, it's even tempting from the platform to shout and to yell, say you forgive them. And you're just like, I'm trying, I'm just trying to get my air back. I want you to hear my heart with today's sermon. My goal is not for you to say, I forgive you before you leave this room. My goal today is that you would begin the journey and the process of healing and forgiving. I wrote it like this in my notes, write this down. My intent is not for you to say, I forgive you with my mouth. My intent is that you would say, I forgive you from my heart. The trauma, the realness that is in this place this morning, I refuse to be a tone-deaf preacher who stands up here and shouts, say you forgive them. But I'm committed to local church being a place where people can get their breath back. Elbow your neighbor and say, get your air back. Get your air back, you gotta get your air back. It's coming back. I love this thought right here. I heard this years ago and it never left me. 
Um, the way we heal in God's economy, I want you to write this down, is called the forgiveness flow. The forgiveness flow. It's really simple. God forgives us in this vertical aspect. It's grace. It's mercy. It touches our life. And then from there, it flows out horizontally. Does that make sense? It's a forgiveness flow. It touches us vertically and it flows out horizontally. In case you've never heard this preached before, you've never had anyone teach you this before, yes, God forgives you vertically so you can go to heaven. But he then asks you to forgive horizontally so you can mend relationships here on earth. Here we go, Matthew 18 is where we're gonna be. I'm gonna move quick right here. Matthew 18, verse 23. I'm gonna read it again. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven. Everybody say the kingdom of heaven. When you see kingdom of heaven in the Bible, it's referring to God's culture, God's way. What's culture? Culture is the way people behave. This is God's culture. This is eternity. This is a different world. The Bible says when Jesus comes back, he's gonna establish a new earth and a new heaven. This is talking about a different world, how God operates, the kingdom of heaven. This is how it should be. Then he goes on to say there's a, there's a king. It's not only a king, there's a servant. The king who wanted to settle his accounts with his servants. The king is not me and it is not you. The king is God. The servant, on the other hand, is me and it is you. This is really important right here. There's so much theology right here that we can't breeze past. The truth is one day we will stand before a king. We will stand before God and accounts will be settled. What has not been paid must be paid. If you don't have a way to cover it, you are held responsible for it. Now watch this in verse 24. Watch this. I'll read 24 and 25. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold brought to him. Since he was not able to pay the master, he ordered he and his wife and his children be sold into slavery to repay the debt. Now you're reading this, you're like, Andrew, um, 10,000 bags of gold? Is that a lot? Because uh, that means nothing to me. Can I, can I phone a friend? Can I, is it like 10,000 bucks? If it's 10,000 bucks, we could probably make it happen. We could probably scrape it together. We could probably do it. Come on, credit card. Hello, somebody. Well, we could probably figure it out. But how much is 10,000 bags of gold? This was an amount that when Jesus said this, the people in the crowd would have gasped. Whoa, that's crazy. I did my research on this. The average annual income in this day, a worker would work all year and they would make one bag of gold. This is 10,000. Using Jesus's multiplier, today it would sound like this. He owed the king $400 billion. Elon Musk can't get you out of this one. Okay, this is a lot of cash. This is a lot of cash on hand, which got me thinking, this is crazy right here. Got me thinking, why in the world would Jesus use such a large number? He's explaining a supernatural principle. A king, what kind of king would lend out $400 billion? Well, no earthly king. What kind of king would hand out $400, no king could, no king would, no earthly king. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Come on, anybody thankful today, we don't serve an earthly king, but we serve a heavenly king. Come on, we can put our hands together for that real quick. <laughs> heavenly king. What's the value of your life? Whatever that is, God gave it to you. Our God is merciful. In the same sentence, our God is just. He's merciful, he gave you life. He gave you life. What did we do with it? We disobeyed God. He's also just. So now it must be paid for. Just really good Bible gospel preaching right here. Watch what Romans says. Romans says this. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift, everybody say the gift. The gift of God is eternal. Has this ever happened to you? It's kind of embarrassing. You ever been to like Starbucks and you went to pay for your coffee and your card declined? Oh, that's never happened to you, but okay, sure. <laughs> it, uh, <clears throat> if you're like me, this happened to me the other day. And um, I went to pay, and for whatever reason, I don't know what's going on, the card declined. And if you're like me, whenever my card declines, I start giving away too much information. <laughs> she said, sir, your card did not go through. I said, what? Oh, I got plenty of money, I promise. I got plenty of money. My accounts are solvent. Well, I'm a good man, I pay my taxes. Let me call my wife, right? Like, it was funny, I'm trying to figure out how to pay for it. She goes, aren't you the pastor at local church? And I said, no. 
I'm not. <laughs> I heard it's a great church. You should go. <laughs> Must be another really good looking guy. But in this case, there is nothing I could say to change the fact that the card I tried to use didn't have enough money on it to pay for the coffee. Didn't matter how embarrassing it was. Didn't matter if I got mixed up and it was the wrong card. It did not matter. You think that's embarrassing? Imagine standing before a heavenly God one day and imagine the horror of him calling you on your debt and you not being able to pay it. What you gonna say? I'm a great man. <laughs> you see, uh, the way my bank account's set up is I got a checking and I got a savings and y'all are too saved. It's just, you know what I'm saying? The way it's, I'm a good man. I serve at church. I went to, 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 the, to the young adult night. I, I, I give in the offering. I do these things. That's got to be worth something. No matter what you say in that moment, nothing will satisfy it. You owe 400 billion bucks. Doesn't matter what you say. Doesn't matter what you feel in the moment. And it's crazy. He calls him on it. And when he calls him on it, he's like, he could never repay it. And then the Bible says he also has him, his wife, and his children sold into slavery to repay the debt. But his wife and kids had nothing to do with it. Isn't it crazy sin will permeate in your life to affect other people that seemingly had nothing to do with it in the beginning? It's affecting your family, man of God. No, it's not. It's just me. No, it's affecting your children. It's affecting your wife. It's affecting your parents. It's like taking a rock and throwing it in the middle of a lake that looks like glass. The ripple effects will go for miles. It's affecting everybody. But watch this, he gets some good news right here. Matthew 18, verse 26, it kind of flips right here. At this, the servant fell on his knees. He's like, I can't pay $400 billion. Be patient with me. I'll pay back everything, I promise. The servant's master, the king, took pity on him and canceled the debt. I don't know about you, I would be pumped. I would be so excited. I would be elated. I would be so fired up. I don't know about you, but I'd probably feel like, I'd, I'd probably start dancing. And I'm not going to. Some of you are like, here it goes. I, I, I might start dancing. Can I ask you a question? How do you respond when you get happy? How, how do you respond when you get grateful? How, how do you respond when you get thankful? How do you respond when you take your focus off of the hurt that people caused and you put your focus on the help that a savior brought? I, I know I'm gonna lose part of the audience here, but any ch I'm talking 90s, early 2000 church kids in the house, wave at me. Okay, you, a lot of you, if you're not part of the subculture, you're not gonna get this, okay? But um, other day I was driving and I just felt like throw, TJ, I just felt like throwing on some like, Old school, like I'm talking Christian music. I'm talking like 88.1 Air One. I, I just wanted to go, I wanted to go way back to when I was a little kid sitting in the back seat of my parents' black expedition. You wanna know what I listen to? You ready for it? Anybody, make some noise if you know who these people are. Um, I, I wanted to listen to some Stephen Curtis Chapman. Okay, there's some Christians here, praise God. Uh, Y'all are gonna know this one though. I wanna to listen to some KJ52. Okay, Tim knows. I, I wanted to listen to some, some DC talk. What would people think if they knew that I was a Jesus freak, right? I saw a man with a bag. No, I'll stop, okay. Like, again, it was, it was a moment. You had to be there. Um, I'm talking delirious. I'm talking, oh, here's one, evanescence. I can't wait, God, bring me back. You remember that? If you're a church kid like me, my, I used when I was a middle schooler, I used to, my parents used to make me be in the little skits. Remember the little skits they would do on stage to the songs? Some of you, you're like, I tried to forget that. I haven't healed from that, Andrew. Why did you bring that up? It's okay, you can respond to the altar in a moment. But, but I can remember, you remember when like the, the angel, Jesus, like they would be the person on the ground, they would like hold back everybody. Do you remember this? I don't know why, I was always the drug dealer. I was always the one trying to sell the drugs. I'd have a Ziploc full of green herbs from my mom's spice rack. Just oregano and parsley. I'm trying to sell this kid drugs. I'm like in middle school, it's crazy. But, but by far, my favorite Christian band when I was younger was this group by the name of Sonic Flood. Okay, praise God, sister. Sonic Flood. Tell me you're a Christian without telling me you're a Christian. 
sonic flood. Like I, I was in the sonic flood and they used to have this song. It was called, I could sing of your love forever. I, I could sing of your love forever. And the bridge in this song said, I feel like dancing. It's foolishness, I know, but I just feel like dancing. And we were riding in the car and I started thinking about local church and I started thinking about literally the last August to August and I started thinking about the last year of my life and I can't lie, y'all, I just, I felt like dancing. And I can't dance. I'm white, I can't dance. Like, I just felt like dancing. I, I just felt like dancing. I felt like worshiping. I felt that in my spirit, but I heard the bridge of that song. It's foolishness, I know. Write this down if you're taking notes. I don't think dancing and I don't think worshiping is foolish at all. I think it's appropriate and reasonable. You were just let off the hook for $400 billion. I'm not saying every time you come to church and the band fires up, you got to clap your hands. I'm not saying every time the preacher says something good that you like, you have to say amen. I'm not saying, but part of me wonders if you've never had that moment, do you actually understand what God has done for you? If you've never been in a worship service where the worship starts, you're like, I'm so overwhelmed. I just got to get in. The, I got to walk for a second. If you've never had that moment, I wonder, do you know what God has done for you? $400 billion. The card declined. He said, take the coffee anyways. He let you off the hook. The card declined. Some Sundays I come in here. You can look at me like I'm crazy. You can look at me partly cloudy. I just feel like worshiping. I just feel like dancing. I just feel like shouting. I just feel like giving my maker all the praise and all the glory. And if it looks silly to you, that's on you. I can't preach a good enough sermon to repay my debt. I can't build a big enough church to repay my debt. My God saved me and showed me mercy. Come on, if we're going to clap, we're going to clap one time. Show me mercy. Forgave me. I owed such a, such a debt, but... Look at the plot twist right here. Go, go to the next scripture. When the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants that owed him 100 silver coins, grabbed him by the neck, and began to choke him. Pay me back what you owe me. What in the world? He was just forgiven $400 billion. He was just forgiven 10,000 bags of gold. Now he's going after some silver coins? I thought that he would be in a little bit of a better mood. But it's funny because this servant actually lives just like we live. Keys can go ahead and join me. This servant lives by the sentiment that I believe 2024 culture lives. Mercy for me, justice for you. Mercy for me, justice for you. Like, like just think about this for a moment. Uh, mercy for me, like I deserve it. You don't deserve it. We, we, we took the girls in 2020 to the doctor. We took them to the doctor's appointment. For whatever reason, when they were there, they had to do um, a test for the virus. They did a test for the virus and Paisley was up first. And she, my daughters, poor girls, man, they, anybody comes in with a white coat, they just cling to us. They don't like it. They don't want to be there. And, and sure enough, they, they do the swab in her nose and she's freaking out. She's crying. She's grabbing onto my hand. She's putting her nails in my arm and they pull it out of her nose and she's like, ah! Evie's turn. It, it, it's mercy for me, but it's justice for you. We halt the forgiveness flow. The forgiveness flow, it, it comes vertical and it touches my life, but then I stop it and I never let it flow out of my life. I gotta read the end of the story here. Watch what the end of the story says right here. I'm gonna keep reading. Next slide if you got it. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged. They went back to the king, told him everything. The master called the servant in and said, man, what are you doing? I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Keep going. Shouldn't have you at least have mercy on your buddy? Verse 34, in anger, the master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured. Listen to me. If you can receive forgiveness, but you can't give forgiveness, it shows me one thing. It shows me that the unforgiveness in your heart indicates that you underestimate our sin against God and you've overestimated other sin against you. You've underestimated your sin against God, but man, you've overestimated other people's sin against 
you. This is crazy. He couldn't pay back the debt. He used this absurd amount of money to show, yo, this was a life sentence. 10 lifetimes, he could have never paid back 10,000 bags of gold. Write this down if you're taking notes. When you hold unforgiveness in your heart, it creates a prison around you. It locks you away. Here it is, hate is a gate. Locks you up. You start by tucking away and keeping everybody else out. And before you know it, you haven't just kept everybody else out, but you've locked yourself in. And you can't go anywhere. Come on, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Listen to me, that hate isn't gonna kill anybody. That hate is gonna kill you. You gotta let it go. Hate's a funny word. Hate's a funny word. Uh, other day, my girl said something about hating. And I said, girls, we don't say hate. We don't say hate in our house. And I started thinking, is that even biblical? Look at what Proverbs says right here. This is interesting. Check this out. There are six things the Lord hates. Okay. The Lord hates. Seven that are detestable to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. Keep going, read the whole thing. A heart that devises wicked schemes. Uh, feet that are quick to rush into evil. A fault witness who pours out lies and stirs up conflict in a community. Can I tell you what our God hates? Our God hates sin. Do, do you see the story coming around full circle? We serve a king who hated sin so much that he became a servant. We serve a king that served and went to a cross to give me and you the strength to let forgiveness flow. Jesus said, I'll go first. I'll forgive first. It's our God in the flesh, Jesus, that sat on a cross as they crucified him. And he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It's the forgiveness flow. It's who we are. It's what we do. I gotta show you the last verse of the story. Verse 35, check this out. This is how, this is, a, this is a sobering verse. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Jeez. God's saying, if you can't show mercy, it shows me you've never received mercy. God's saying, if you can't forgive, guess what? I can't forgive. It's the Bible that says, vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. There are some of you, you're so hurt by a group of people that you are trying to take vengeance on them and doing so you are actually stopping the, in, the intervention of God. God can't get involved because you've got hate in your heart. I'm saying this morning, turn it over. I feel like when this is preached, and I'm bringing this thing in for a landing, I feel like when this is preached, it's sometimes preached from a very legalistic view. This is for somebody. We'll read a verse like that and it's like, oh, okay. God's hands are tied. God's up in heaven and he, he wants to forgive me, but his hands are tied. I mean, because I won't forgive, God's like, man, I wish you'd forgive so I can forgive. No, it's actually the opposite. Our God went to send his son to a cross. His hands are open and he is giving forgiveness to you. It's not his hands that are tied. It's your hands that are tied. And you can't receive his forgiveness, therefore you can't let forgiveness flow. It touches my life vertically. It flows out of my life horizontally. Write this down, forgiveness is about setting the captive free, only to realize in the end, you were the captive. You gotta let it go. We forgive to forgive. It's what we do, we have to let it go. Can we stand to our feet all across this place? I wonder this morning, there's some people here on week four of asking for a friend and you'd be real enough to say, I need to begin the process of healing. I'm not healed. I haven't forgiven. I've harnessed ill will. And I just wonder today if a group of people would be willing to get in the presence of God so that the forgiveness flow could give us the strength to flow out. But Andrew, I can't, I don't have the strength to forgive him. Andrew, I don't have the strength to forgive them. 
I, when I think about that person, when I even hear that name, it makes me angry. I don't have the strength. You're right, you don't. But he does. And he went to a cross so that you can let forgiveness flow. Heads bowed, eyes closed all across this place. The rage, the ill will, the unforgiveness, it's killing nobody but you. It's hurting nobody but you. It, it, it is, it, it's taking you out of the game. It is dominating your life. But if you're honest enough to say like, Andrew, this was for me. Week four of asking for a friend was for me. I got pain. I got pain in my life that is so big, it hijacks my life. It hijacks my mind. It hijacks my heart. And yes, that hurt. If I'm not careful, I will go to a place of hate. But today I wanna deal with the hurt because it dictates my future today I need to begin, I'm not saying it ends in a 45 minute sermon, but I am saying today for you in your life, the process to healing can begin. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I need to step into the forgiveness flow. Shoot that hand up. I need to step into it. Hands are up all over the place. I need need to let it go. I need to let it go. Come on, there's more, put your hand up. I, I need to let it go. Come on, I'm gonna ask you to be bold. You're only as honest as you are strong. You're only as strong as you are honest. Well, if you gotta forgive some people, why don't you just join me down here in these altars? Hands are up all over the place. You're not alone. Just move. Come on, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming. People are moving all across this place. Come on, if that's you, move, move. Maybe it's a friend. You got a friend with you. Why don't you move with your friend? Why don't you come down here with your friend? I gotta let forgiveness flow. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. Come on, come, come, come. I wanna pray for us, heads bowed, eyes closed. Why don't we stretch our hands to heaven? Come on, man, join me a little bit here. Lord Jesus, I pray right now that we would let forgiveness flow. I've got to address it. I've got to let it go. If I don't let it go, it is going to hijack my life. I've got to move on. It doesn't end today, but you better believe the process must start today. I'm letting it go. Forgiveness is a release, healing is a process, and the process starts today. Come on, let's just sing for just a moment. Let's just keep worshiping in this place. Come on, let's sing it out. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and
heads bowed, eyes closed all across this place. Can't end this service without doing this. I know we're a little over time. That's okay. Maybe you're here today and the forgiveness hasn't ever flowed vertically for you. It's hard to forgive horizontally when you haven't let the forgiveness come from heaven. But today, I wanna surrender my life to Jesus. I, I want the forgiveness flow to ring true in my life. Doesn't matter if you're in the seat still, if you're here in this altar, heads bowed, eyes closed. I don't have a relationship with God, Andrew, but I want one. I'm not gonna call anybody out, I'm not gonna embarrass you, but just right where you are, would you just slip your hand up? I, I wanna surrender my life to Jesus today. I, I wanna surrender my life, I see that, I wanna surrender. I see that hand, I see that hand, I wanna surrender. Come on, if there's anybody else, I just wanna surrender my life. Come on, why don't we end local church this morning with just a big local church family prayer. Come on, if you're in the altar next to some friends, next to some family, why don't you put your arm around them? See somebody standing alone, why don't you just reach an arm over and put it on their shoulder? There's power in prayer. I wanna end this in prayer. Lord Jesus, we love you. Lord, we come before you today in awe and all of what you're doing in a church. But that's not the best part. We stand in awe in what you're doing in a person, in each person in this room. Every number has a name, every name has a story, and every story matters to you, Jesus. But we let it go, letting it flow. I'm not saying it ends today, but what we are saying is it starts today. So it's not the finish line, these are the starting blocks. We're coming out of them and we are running towards a life of forgiveness. Lord, for the three people here this morning that are surrendering their hearts to you. God, I pray today, August 11th, 2024, would be a day they never forget. I pray it would be a day where everything changed. I'm not saying it's gonna be perfect from here on out, but as a follower of Jesus, we are never down. We are either up or we are getting back up. And Lord, I pray right now some people would get up. Lord, we step into a new life with you, running after you. And Lord, as we close service, we declare as a church that the best is yet to come. Come on, if you believe it, can you say amen? All across this place, let's put our hands together one more time. One more time.